Ladies and gentlemen, I greet you all to this extremely important conference. And I'm giving you in the beginning the most heartfelt greetings of Mr. Lyndon LaRouche, who is in spirit with us in this conference and whose prophetic work has uh, contributed very much <clears throat> that there is a solution in the world today. But I have to tell you that we are in a crisis moment of unprecedented dimensions. Humanity right now is on the edge of a genocide which could become worse than anything ever happened in history. And as of now, if the present policies of the transatlantic sector are continued, it will happen. In the short term, we face the coincidence of three mortal dangers. We have the expansion of the ISIS terrorism, which is already causing genocide against the Kurdish, Iraqi, Iraqi, Syrian populations, as well as religious minorities. And that could very quickly reach the point where the nations against which this terrorism is directed have no other possibility left than <clears throat> to fight wars. Uh, and that then could blow up the entire Southwest Asia region, and it could ignite a global war. The second equally mortal danger, or equally dangerous situation, is the pandemic of Ebola, which is already completely out of control. And it is right now not only ravaging in several West African nations, but it is spreading to Europe, to the United States, and to Latin America. And contrary to irresponsible assurances that in the so-called advanced sector it is absolutely uh, <clears throat> not possible to, to spread, and that the advanced, so-called advanced countries are prepared, due to the cuts in the health sector, uh, that could also go completely out of control. And the third mortal danger is that we are facing with an absolute certainty a new financial crash, which is going to be much worse than 2008. Uh, and if then the EU and the United States are going for the so-called bail-in, that is the Cyprus model, uh, taking a haircut of all the people who have accounts in the banks, then that would throw the world into a dark age. And with that, um, you know, also a war would result and the danger of all weapons in existence would come uh, to be used. Now, the key to emphasize is that all of these three dangers are not the result of inevitable processes, but they are all man-made. And <clears throat> therefore, uh, they can be remedied, but it has to be first recognized that they are the results of policy failures of the establishment of the transatlantic region. And they can only be co corrected if the political will can be mobilized to do so. Now, concerning the first threat, uh, the I, uh, IS Caliphate, uh, which um, is uh, right now uh, advancing uh, massively despite the bombing. Uh, my husband, Lyndon LaRouche, produced a movie in 1999 which had the title Storm Over Asia, which was uh, uh, characterized by a prophetic prescience uh, showing where the policies of the Anglo-Americans would lead to. Please first clip. What you're seeing is a war in the North Caucasus region on southern Russia. What you're also seeing is a war which is broken out simultaneously in the border between Pakistan and India. The forces behind these attacks on Russia and on India are the same. They are a mercenary force which was first set into motion 
by policies adopted at a trilateral commission meeting in Kyoto, Japan in 1975. The policies originally of Brzezinski and his number two man there, Samuel P. Huntington. The policies which were continued by then uh, Trilateral Commission member, that is back in 1975, George Bush, before he became Vice President. These are policies which were continued by George Bush as Vice President. This is under Bush, this was became known as the Iran-Contra Drug Finance Link Operations of mercenaries deployed with private funding all over the world, recruited from Islamic and other countries, and targeting Russia's flank. This mercenary force created then still exists. The primary responsibility for creating the force was the government of the United Kingdom, most notably, most emphatically, the government of Margaret Thatcher, Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher, a policy which has been accelerated and continued in full madness by the present Prime Minister, Tony Blair of the United Kingdom. This war, if continued, using mercenaries, can lead to nuclear general war. The major powers principally threatened today by this mercenary operation are two of the world's largest nations, China and India. China on its western borders, India on its northern borders. Of course, Iran is also threatened, but more notably, Russia. If these nations are pushed to the wall by a continuing escalation of a war, which is modeled on the wars which the British ran against Russia, China, and so forth, during the 19th century and early 20th century. This will lead to the point that Russia has to make the decision to accept disintegration of Russia as a nation or to resort to the means it has to exact terrible penalties on those who are attacking it. Going closer and closer to the source, the forces behind the mercenaries, which includes, of course, Turkey, which is a prime NATO asset being used as a cover for much of this mercenary operation in the North Caucasus and in Central Asia. Now, the Islamic card, uh, <clears throat> to use the Islamic card against the Soviet Union, uh, was originally the idea of Brzezinski, who presented this policy at a conference of the Trilateral Commission in Kyoto in 1975. But then, uh, after the Mujahideen were trained for the fight against the Soviet Union in Afghanistan, that movement uh, <coughs> took on a life of its own. And it spread from Afghanistan to Central Asia, to Dagestan, to Chechnya, to Pakistan, and uh, beyond. This already uh, created uh, havoc enough, but then what was added was the police of regime change, uh, which uh, was the result of the intention by the Anglo-Americans to turn the world into a, a global empire after the collapse of the Soviet Union. And the policy of regime change worsened the situation by dismantling states as organizational principles of the international order. In 2003, the war against Saddam Hussein uh, and Iraq, which was based entirely on lies manufactured by uh, Tony Blair and the MI6, uh, indeed uh, turned Iraq into a country bombed back into the Stone Age. And it was left as a breeding ground for the present terrorism wave which we see. Then the war against Libya, uh, which again was based on lies, uh, where the UN veto powers, Russia and China, were betrayed by being told that it was just a humanitarian intervention and no war, which is why they voted uh, neutral uh, in the vote in the UN Security Council. Now, if you look at Libya, it's a country in complete and total chaos. Then the lies against Syria, 
that the Assad government would have used chemical weapon, which is not uh, proven, but to the contrary, it is proven that it was used by the rebels, which were suppo suppo uh, supported by Saudi Arabia and the West. Nevertheless, the lie that Assad has used chemical weapons is being maintained by the official mass media up to the present day. The military strikes were prevented in the last minute, but as a result, if you look at the entire region, uh, Iraq and Syria today are too weak to cope with the uh, uh, ISIS. And in Europe, you have right now completely foolish proposals, like coming from the Green Party to use German troops under a UN mandate, uh, which at, as of now will not occur, not at least because the green policies of backing a Nazi coup in Ukraine helped to contribute to the isolation of Russia. And therefore, the chances that under present conditions, a UN mandate for, this, for such a mission uh, will not happen. The German foreign minister uh, makes the point uh, makes that point, but then he goes of all places to Saudi Arabia uh, to emphasize the leading role Saudi Arabia should play in the fight against IS. <laughs> now, you can uh, you know, go uh, <clears throat> to uh, the, the, <clears throat> the uh, goat if you want to protect the cabbage uh, and ask him to guard the garden. For politi the political spokesman of the CDU, Philip Misfelder, uh, says, uh, that for Syria, the only, there can only be a political solution without Assad, but temporarily we may have to back Assad because otherwise the ISIS takes over. Now this is amateur's night. Uh, these dabblers in politics play with a situation which could lead to World War III in the short term. In the United States right now, there is a growing uh, revolt uh, the demand to get to the bottom of the present crisis uh, with ISIS by looking at what were the real circumstances of 9-11 uh, and to pu publicize the entire official September 11 report, which was produced at the time under the leadership of Senator Bob Graham uh, and <coughs> investigated the circumstances of September 11. Now, the big fight in the United States, which could determine where the world goes, is the fight to release the 28 pages, which are classified uh, to the present day. They were classified by George Bush, and Obama promised in the 2008 election campaign that he would declassify this report and give the, the 3,000 families whose uh, family members were killed in the a twin tower uh, attack, the right to find out what really happened. Now, there is right now, not at least due to our own efforts, uh, a growing number of congressmen who demand that this 28 pages be declassified. Now, the Canadian Broadcast <coughs> Corporation uh, a week ago had an 11-minute program where they discussed exactly the importance of these 28 pages. First clip. Our biggest problem is our allies. Our allies in the region were our largest problem in Syria. Now, that was the voice of Vice President Biden, who made a much uh, notified speech about two, three weeks ago, where he said that the problem with the present bombing of the ISIS uh, by the United States is the fact that you know the allies, the, the Saudi Arabia, Qatar, the Emirates, that they are pursuing quite different policies and that the United States has no allies. But much more to the point is what uh, Senator Bob Graham, who is still under obligation uh, of secrecy because it's classified, However, he is increasing the pressure that these 28 pages must be made public. Next clip. The connection is a direct one. 
Uh, not only has Saudi Arabia been promoting this extreme form of religion, but it also has been the principal financier, uh, first of al-Qaeda, then of the various al-Qaeda franchises around the world, specifically the ones in Somalia and Yemen, uh, and now uh, the support of ISIS. Now, this is dynamite. And, you know, the scandal is obviously that, I mean, all the heads of state of Europe and beyond know this, because Senator Bob Graham is an extremely uh, recognized and uh, uh, high-reputated uh, senator. Uh, he was the head of the September 11 Commission. And, for example, Mr. Steinmeier, who in the, his capacity of the cabinet chief of Schröder, uh, when, he was, uh, when Schröder was chancellor, was in charge of secret services. And now, being the foreign minister for the second time, there is no way how he cannot know that. And so that goes for all the European governments. So the scandal which we have to uh, uh, really make public and use for a change in policy is the fact that the same countries which have been financing and building up first uh, the Mujahideen, then the Al-Qaeda, then Al-Nusra, and now the ISIS, they are supposed to be the ones in the coalition to fight ISIS, which obviously is a complete farce. Now, Bloomberg, the news uh, service, had also a couple of days ago a story where they say that the Islamic State grooms Chechen fighters against Putin. And the top, uh, one of the top ISIS commanders, who is a Georgian, uh, whose neck nickname is Omar the Chechen, uh, his name is Omar al-Shishani, openly says the ultimate target of ISIS is President Putin. We also know that the majority of the ISIS fighters are actually from Chechnya. Uh, and they are preparing to bring the fight, which is right now raging in Southwest Asia, into Russia. The leader of the Nazis in Ukraine, uh, of the right sector, Dmitry, Dmitry Yarosh, uh, called on the Chechen warlord, Doku Umarov, to take arms up against Russia. And this Yarosh, by the way, fought in the first Chechen war uh, against Russia on the side of the Chechens. So as we can see very clearly, these operations are not just in the Middle East, but they are directed against Russia and also China. On the 4th of July uh, of this year, the ISIS leader Abu Bakr al-Baghdad uh, uh, published a map uh, which showed the extended, extended uh, caliphate they are trying to build into Xinjiang of China. And he also named 20 countries that so supposedly seized Muslim rights. Now, what conclusion can we draw out of all of this? Rather than allying with countries that helped to groom and finance ter terrorist groupings from the Mujahideen uh, to ISIS to the present day, if we want to prevent the escalation of this uh, <clears throat> uh, situation into World War III, we absolutely have to change course and form an alliance that includes Russia, China, India, Iran, Syria, and Egypt. And only if we change the policy in this direction can this crisis be stopped. It also means urgently to put the question of a new all-inclusive security architecture on the table, because it is basically a situation where you cannot have uh, you know, some countries on a confrontation course with Russia uh, and uh, basically hope to avoid World War III. We have to go back to the rule of international law. We have to go back to the absolute respect of national sovereignty as it developed uh, during the Peace of Westphalia negotiations and as it is represented today in the UN Charter. Also, the entire paradigm of regime change through color revolution, which is warfare even if it's not declared, has to be outlawed. 
but especially the Blair Doctrine of so-called humanitarian intervention. In 1999, Blair gave a speech in <coughs> Chicago uh, which changed the doctrine of NATO and the West completely. Uh, basically by saying uh, that from now on humanitarian military interventions are allowed by NATO even without UN mandates uh, and the first time this was applied in this period in the Kosovo war against Yugoslavia. We also have to absolutely urgently scrap the right to protect which was uh, a consequence of this Blair doctrine and it was adopted in 2005 by the World Summit of the United Nations, because this policy has led to the present erosion as we see it uh, in uh, Southwest Asia and Africa uh, right now. We have to go back to the Peace of Westphalia uh, of 16, next clip, uh, of 1648, which ended successfully uh, 150 years uh, of religious war. Uh, and which represented uh, a, an absolute breakthrough and the first time the establishment of, uh, <clears throat> of uh, international law. If you look at the principles of the Peace of Westphalia, uh, the first principle said, for the sake of peace, all crimes of all sides must be forgotten. Uh, and the second principle was that from now on, foreign policy must be based on the interest of the other. Uh, there must be an absolute respect for national sovereignty. And that means today that we absolutely must end the idea of geopolitical interest of one nation or a group of nations. Because it is geopolitics which have, has led uh, to two world wars in the last century. And it is about to lead to a third world war uh, coming out of the great game policy and the encirclement against Russia and China. We have to replace geopolitics with the idea of the common aims of mankind. And we need to build a new security architecture that must take care of the interest of every single nation on the planet. The Chinese President Xi Jinping has said repeatedly that you cannot have security on the world for some nations and chaos for others. Now, if we look at the second mortal danger, the Ebola pandemic, this is already completely out of control. As of now, there is no treatment, no cure, and no vaccine, and the Ebola is an extremely aggressive virus which has a mortality rate between 70 and 80 percent. The rate of growth is increasing exponentially. And the present estimates are that by January of next year, there will be probably conservatively estimated 1.5 million people uh, infected. There are presently anywhere between 10 and 20,000 new cases per week. Uh, basically, the health workers have given up to count because it is completely out of control. In March, when the first outbreak uh, was known by uh, West African countries, uh, <coughs> essentially Sierra Leone, Liber Liberia, and Guinea, these countries uh, asked for help from the World Health Organization and the United Nations, and they did not get any help. Now, uh, it is right now uh, <clears throat> practically a situation where the uh, medical personnel have given up in these countries because they, they just, you know, it's a situation like in the, described by Boccaccio in the Decameron where, you know, basically people were first put into uh, treatment camps then into holding camps because there were too many people, but then you know ho these holding camps just turned into death camps, and then people were just told, stay at home, uh, here you have some aspirin, don't leave the house, uh, and that simply meant that the families uh, soon uh, would be all uh, affected. Now, already in 1972, uh, my husband uh, had called for a task force to investigate the 
uh, long-term implications of the IMF conditionality policies. And he at that time said, if the IMF policies will be applied, then it will lead to a biological catastrophe uh, down the road. But as we know, in 1974, you had Henry Kissinger, uh, when he was the head of the National Security Council in the United States, who published the infamous NSM 200 memorandum, which simply said that the population growth in some countries in the third world is the biggest threat to the national security interest of the United States, because too many people use up too many raw materials, and therefore this population growth should be discouraged. Now, this means uh, of the IMF conditionality, because if you tell a third world country uh, you cannot invest in health uh, policies, you cannot inv invest in infrastructure, but you have to pay your debt, the consequences uh, are <coughs> very clear. And the wretched condition of many countries, especially in Africa in the world today, are the deliberate intention of the present uh, uh, world system. Now, we should also remember that the British policy has been population reduction at least since uh, World War II, where the, by the end of it, Bertrand Russell, uh, in an article in the Impact uh, in Science magazine with the title The Impact of Science uh, on Politics, uh, demanded uh, or said it, it would be very advantageous if every generation would have a deadly pandemic because then population would be reduced and the remaining survivors could pro procreate uh, more freely without causing overpopulation. And we should also keep in mind that Prince Philip has been on the record many times in public conferences saying that if he would be uh, reincarnated, he would like to come back as a deadly virus to help to, help to reduce the population. Now, in 2008, the CDC, the Center of Disease Control in the United States, wrote a memorandum to the incoming President uh, Obama, or actually already during the election campaign, which was published yesterday uh, due to the Freedom of Information procedure in the United States. Uh, where it became clear uh, that uh, this was published in the Washington Times, uh, where the CDC in 2008 said that the planned funding cuts would lead to a situation where simple diseases like rabies, uh, hepatitis A, uh, and Ebola could become a, a, a mortal danger. Now, obviously, this was completely ignored, and the cuts uh, were absolutely uh, <clears throat> traumatic. Now, what we have to do today uh, is basically uh, to remedy a situation where, you know, I mean, the situation in Europe and the United States is much, much worse, because it turns out um, that, for example, in Spain, where uh, the first cases emerged and then many of the nurses got infected, there was no protocol for the health workers. Uh, the, the, instead of using, uh, of bringing people to a level four hospital, there was a complete lack of preparedness and uh, basically uh, the nurses, uh, uh, you know, were left to, to figure out what they should do. Um, in the United States, there are only four hospitals which can treat on level four such patients. In Germany, there's only room for 50 patients. And on last Wednesday, there was a conference call in the United States where the National Nurses United uh, Nurses Trade Union was on a conference call with, uh, with 11,500 nurses on the course, uh, call. Uh, and they basically uh, <clears throat> blamed Obama for the utter unpreparedness of the U.S. healthcare system, where they have received no training, no protective gear, and no means for, of uh, disposal of the infected material, no respirators. And there is also research uh, by uh, Rebecca Milner of the International Medi Medical Corps from the University of Minnesota that contrary to the official uh, line, uh, Ebola can be transmitted 
uh, on an aerosol uh, level. With other words, that it's not true that you know only body uh, contact uh, can can transmit. Now, the Spanish military proposed last August, uh, that is two months ago, when this case was known, uh, <coughs> to uh, basically uh, use the um, as, uh, to, to use the Army's highly trained ABC uh, uh, teams, uh, nuclear, biological, uh, chemical weapon teams, to take charge of handling the situation uh, because they are trained to do so. But this was rejected by the government. Instead, people were sent to the Madrid Carlos III Hospital and um, basically uh, the Spain's uh, Spain's most advanced infectious disease unit uh, had been dismantled a year earlier to cut cost and to, uh, due to privatization. So therefore, untrained um, <clears throat> uh, personnel was given a 20-minute video instead. And uh, <clears throat> basically, you know, naturally now many people are infected. Now, the angry military ABC experts gave an interview to El Confidential Di Digital, uh, basically saying that their teams, uh, uh, when, and they reported when their teams are being uh, trained, they are trained to put on and take off the protective gear hundreds of times, and an officer is standing behind them and tells them uh, at every error, if this was a real case, you would be dead now. Now, 500 doctors, nurses, and medical personnel put out a statement uh, that the most uh, deadly virus is the policy of the Spanish government and the health officials who are tearing apart the public health system by privatization. And that obviously does not only apply for, for Spain. Now, uh, <clears throat> the European health ministers uh, basically um, Still have the line um, that you know it's uh, it's it's not it's not out of control and you know it's not transmittable by aerosol ways, but we have to absolutely say that the worst risk for the rapid spread of Ebola in uh, Europe right now uh, is the po the policy of austerity by the Troika because they have dismantled the health systems of. Squeeze Italy, Spain, Portugal. And you can actually see the criminal negligence of these governments by the fact that they focus now mainly on the uh, screening uh, in airports and railroads uh, of arriving passengers to check out their temperature, which is an absolute, uh, does not prevent any, uh, <clears throat> any uh, uh, infection at all. Now, the uh, if you look at the figures in Europe, the hospital beds per 100,000 inhabitants have decreased from 2003 to 2014 with the austerity policies of the Troika. In Germany, by minus 6 percent. In France, minus 16 percent. In Italy, minus 18 percent. And Europe at this point is not prepared because it takes up to 20 medical personnel uh, to treat one single patient. So you can imagine uh, what the situation is. Now, obviously, what should be done is uh, we should absolutely go into an emergency, uh, emergency mode to stop the crisis in Africa, uh, which is not being done right now. <clears throat> what we need, would need is to send the hospital ships of every army around the world uh, because all of these countries are on the coast. So then, you know, you could at least uh, treat a lot of patients already. Uh, also, the 3,500 American soldiers who have been deployed there uh, to build up facilities have not built up one single building. So rather than waiting and losing more precious time, one should simply take buildings, turn them very quickly into level four hospitals, and really try to contain uh, this uh, epidemic before it is completely uh, too late. And use especially 
uh, those sections by the international armies which have been trained for biological warfare because these are the only existing capabilities right now uh, which can do so. And there, again, without the cooperation of the United States, Russia, China, India, European countries and others, this cannot be solved. So we have two situations where the continuation of the confrontation against Russia is absolutely suicidal for the human race. And I can assure you that there will be in the next weeks and months a growing panic in the world about all of these situations, and we have to help to turn that panic into the recognition that the human race must change its course, that we must have an international new security architecture where all of these countries are working together to contain uh, these mortal dangers. Now, uh, already in uh, 1970, in the 70s, La Rouge called for uh, 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 for a, 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 a biological defense initiative. This occurred then uh, in the context of the IMF measures. He reiterated that call uh, in, after the anthrax attacks uh, in the United States in the context of September 11, and he called for a national defense against germ warfare, drawing on the lessons of the principles of national uh, uh, which were drawn in the Korea War and which then uh, were turned into the Hill Burton legislation in the United States. In February 2006, I called for a biological defense initiative after the bird flu had reached three continents and there was the immediate danger of mutation of this virus uh, that it could be uh, uh, transmuted to be communicated from person to person. Now, the World Health Organization um, <clears throat> uh, reported at that time uh, in 91 uh, <clears throat> that there would be a window of 10 years before the combination of old and new pandemics uh, and antibiotic resistance diseases would create the condition for a biological holocaust. Now, this was 14 years ago, and obviously uh, it is more urgent to pool all international resources of all medical facilities and you know re avoid the kind of duplication which is now occurring because you know people are still lo looking for patents uh, to make profit when this is a question where a black death could diminish the world population like it did in the 14th century now uh, <coughs> this biological uh, <coughs> initiative um, uh, basically, uh, would basically require a thorough crash, thorough going crash program, uh, <clears throat> you know, to to find to find uh, the solutions. Uh, but it should have a completely different approach, uh, not the profit of pharmaceutical companies, but to look at the fundamental question: what life really is. Uh, namely from the standpoint of the connection between the biosphere and the noosphere in the sense of the Russian scientist Vladimir Vernatsky. Now, it was already clear since the 70s that we are heading towards a new financial crash and the new danger of a new fascism. This was the famous prognosis of my husband, Lyndon LaRouche, on the 15th of August, 1971, when Nixon decoupled uh, the dollar from go the gold standard and dismantled the Bretton Woods system. And he predicted at that point it would come to a new crash. In the meantime, the international financial system has become more criminal. And it is right now, uh, it has turned into what John Siegler, who is the new UN commissioner for the investigation of vulture funds, uh, has, has called a cannibalistic system where the most criminal element are the vulture funds, uh, <clears throat> which uh, basically are responsible in large part for the condition of not only Argentina, which is fighting a very courageous battle, but also, uh, for example, Africa, because the same vulture funds which demand from Argentina uh, to have the full payment for junk bonds, which they bought for 48 millions, they want to have now 850 millions, which would mean a profit rate of 
1,608% uh, 1, in six years. Now, they have done the same to Congo Brazzaville. Uh, a fund called Elliot, Elliot Management, owned by the same Paul, Paul Singer, uh, who is in the war against Argentina. Now, uh, we should just simply know how many uh, medicines, how much food, how many housing one could build with the millions these vulture funds uh, and uh, <clears throat> uh, you know criminal activities are causing. Uh, lots of these lives could be saved and could have been saved in the last 40 decades. Uh, and we at the time said that the IMF policies were 100 times worse than those of Adolf Hitler. And if you look at how many people have been killed in the meantime, that was not an exaggeration uh, at all. Now, this system uh, basically, uh, which has led to a situation where 85 individuals own as much as 3.5 billion people, uh, this is about to crash. It will disintegrate, and as of now, uh, if nothing is changed in time, uh, it will be much worse than in 2008, because the two big to fail banks are 50% bigger, they are 50% more indebted, um, and uh, there is right now a chorus of financial experts who say that the big one is about to happen. William White, the ex-chief of the Bank of International Settlement, Guy Debel, the head of the BIS Market Committee, uh, says this will be a relatively violent crash. Uh, Thomas Hoenig, the vice chairman of the FDIC, said recently, if one too big to fail bank comes down, it will be the entire system. Uh, and, uh, you know, basically uh, all the EU and the US administration have prepared is a bail-in, which is a haircut, the Cyprus model. Now, what I said in the beginning, these three existential threats coincide. And if there is not a dramatic shift in the paradigm, we all, as well as those who are responsible, are as good as dead. Now, fortunately, there is a solution and a way out, because there is a parallel development which has developed as a direct reaction to the utterly immoral and criminal casino system of profit maximization for a few and poverty and death for millions, if not billions. The preparation for this alternative system is underway since a very long time. It was the fight of the non-aligned movement in the 60s and in the 70s for a new world order, but at that point it was crushed and it suffered many uh, <clears throat> setbacks. This organization uh, is fighting for this parallel system since Lyndon LaRouche called for an international development bank in 1975, and we have been fighting for this in the last 40 years. But now a new era of civilization began when President Xi Jinping announced last year uh, that there should be a new Silk Road policy built uh, when he was in Kazakhstan. Uh, next clip. The ancient Silk Road, uh, which was um, <clears throat> basically built uh, 2,000 years ago. Oh. Yeah, the old Silk Road, uh, which was built 2,000 years ago during the Han Dynasty. Uh, at that time, it led to an exchange of goods, technologies, ideas, cultures, and it indeed was a tremendous uh, uh, victory because it had to overcome in unbelievable challenge, challenges like the Taklamakan Desert, where people had to travel with horses, camels, and <clears throat> uh, by foot and ship. Now, uh, this is uh, a place where I had the fortune uh, to visit uh, end, uh, end of August uh, on the invitation of the Sung Ching Ling Foundation and the Dun Dunhuang Academy. 
uh, where we uh, were invited to make a trip last August along the ancient Silk Road from Lanshu to the Great Wall uh, in <coughs> Jiagu, Jiayuguan, Dunhuang, and uh, the Great Wall even more west in the Gobi uh, Desert. Uh, <coughs> now, uh, this, by the way, is very interesting. You think there is only desert. But there you see these uh, arcs. This is the beginning of the new uh, rail line, uh, which will go uh, all the way from Lancho to Urumqi uh, and beyond. Um, it is being built with, with very fast uh, speed. Now, the new Silk Road is not just the connection from China through Central Asia to Europe. It's an open concept. Every country on the planet is invited to join. Next. <clears throat> um, then in November, Xi Jinping uh, added to that, uh, this is the, uh, uh, the BRICS countries and uh, <clears throat> uh, the other countries working with the BRICS. Uh, in, in November last year, Xi Jinping added the Maritime Silk Road. And in May, there was the breakthrough summit in Shanghai between President Putin and President Xi Jinping. Uh, where they concluded a 30-year 30 30-year 30 agreement uh, with the 30-year uh, gas deal and 40 uh, agreements. In July, there took place the meeting of the BRICS countries in Fortaleza, Brazil, and also the CELAC countries, the 17 heads of state, uh, the UNASUR uh, countries, and then later meetings of the ASEAN and the Brazil. Uh, and go back to the, uh, to the green map you had before. This is now uh, the new system. This represents more than half of humanity, and these countries are engaged in a completely different paradigm than you have any inkling uh, we have in the United States or in Europe. Uh, <clears throat> there is a tremendous cultural optimism in China. China is a country which is, has developed in the most unbelievable way in the last 30 years. In 30 years, they have undergone a development which for most countries of the so-called advanced sector, it took several centuries. And they are now offering that kind of development to the participating countries of the new Silk Road. It is also a new conception of man. Mankind, uh, mankind's identity as defined from the future and its relationship to the cosmic order. This part of the world is presently operating in completely different principles. And the Silk Road is not a geopolitical conception, but it is superseding a uh, national interest for, as a basis for the collaboration among nations for the common interest of mankind. In Fortaleza, a gigantic number of large development projects were agreed upon among various nations, and I only want to name a few to give you an, a feeling for the magnitude of these projects. First, new credit mechanisms and uh, commitments to principle were agreed upon as the basis to lift the entire planet onto a completely new trajectory of development. There were three banks are being built now, the Asia Infrastructure uh, Investment Bank, the New Development Bank, the Shanghai Corporation Bank, which are no longer giving credit for speculation, but only to finance projects. And they, these three banks, even so, they are not yet in full development, will become the lifeboat when the Titanic of the transatlantic system is collapsing. Now, among the many projects which were included uh, was the idea to build, with Chinese help, a second Panama Canal in Nicaragua, connecting, uh, connecting the Pacific and the Caribbean uh, to become the focal point of an entire Central American Caribbean basin. Uh, and this was designed with the uh, top Chinese water management rail aviation port design company, uh, which basically uh, worked out two airports, uh, two seaports, one airport, an artificial lake, uh, a cement and steel plant, 
And uh, this was designed by the Shongyang Institute uh, of Survey Planning and Research, which also had designed the Three Gorges Dam. Russia, in the meantime, has uh, expressed interest to participate uh, in this, uh, in this uh, the concept. Next, the Brazil-Peru Transcontinental Railroad. Klappt nicht? Oh. Um, <clears throat> Uh, this is a gigantic uh, project uh, where <clears throat> uh, basically for the first time a railroad is going to be built from Brazil, from the uh, Atlantic coast uh, <clears throat> to uh, the Pacific coast in Peru. Now, between a meeting of uh, Dilma Rousseff and Xi Jinping, uh, Dilma Rousseff said, this is fundamental to the South African integration and an outlet for the Brazilian exports, uh, exports to Asia. Now, Bolivia, in the meantime, has asked China for help in building the Bolivian part, uh, alter an, an alternative transcontinental route from Brazil through Bolivia to Peru. There is a whole series of projects between Russia and Nicaragua, Russia and Cuba. Between China and Cuba, 29 big projects. Between Russia and Bolivia, nuclear, uh, nuclear plants, infrastructure. Uh, between China and Bolivia, they work on satellite cooperation. Argentina and Russia, infrastructure, nuclear design, Uh, construction, the operation of nuclear plants and research reactor, uh, water desalinization, and many other projects. Then between Brazil and Russia, trade, military, nuclear cooperation, they want to double the trade uh, <clears throat> per year. Uh, they also build together an anti-air defense system to expand the Klona satellite navigation system. Uh, between Brazil and China, there has now developed a truly strategic partnership. They are deepening space cooperation, joint satellite work with Africa, and also Brazil is buying jets from China, uh, selling sets, jets to China, and they have large scientific exchanges. Between Argentina and China, infrastructure, nuclear cooperation, altogether 19 agreements. Between Venezuela and China, Uh, China and Mexico, China and India. And when on the 17th to 20th of September of this year, Xi Jinping visited uh, India in a big state visit, they agreed upon 10 major economic deals and collaboration of nuclear science, especially the thorium-based uh, nuclear reactor and also uh, Chinese pebble bed solid fuel 100 megawatt demonstration reactor. All of these projects are extremely important because they show the way to the future. They are doing things, these countries are doing high-speed things. The entire transatlantic region has given up like nuclear energy for the sake of speculation and worthless money and profit. But even if these projects are obviously extremely important, the spirit of a new renaissance Uh, of the nations of the BRICS and the countries collaborating with the BRICS is even more important. Because the population in the US and Europe has become culturally so pessimistic that it is very difficult to imagine that there are leaders in the world who are indeed fighting for the common good of their own people. If you look at the speech of Xi Jinping in New Delhi um, <coughs> during the state visit, I uh, urge all of you to read that speech because it is Uh, a speech which represents the highest level of statecraft uh, and, you know, indeed the, expresses the principle of the peace of Westphalia. Uh, he said that China and India share a long history of friendship of over 2,000 years. Buddhism developed from India and was brought to China by monks. He mentioned Ji Xianlin, the master of Chinese studies who was an expert in Sanskrit. He mentioned the Admiral Sheng He of the Ming Dynasty who made seven voyages of exploration and visited India six times. And uh, from China, uh, they brought astronomy, calendars, literature, architecture, which were all introduced to China. And in turn, China 
uh, brought paper manufacturing, silk, porcelain, tea, music to India. India, Xi Jinping said, supported China during the Opium War, and China encouraged the Indian independence movement. Then he quoted at length Rabindranath Tagore, the great Indian poet, uh, who is adored by the Chinese people, and he quoted him saying when he uh, <clears throat> came to China, I don't know, but I feel as if I come back home when I'm in China. And when he left, he said, my heart remains here. Then Xi Jinping addressed the youth of Chi Chinese and Indian youth in the audience and said, I hope you can absorb the wisdom of the ancient history of China and India and continue forward in the pursuit of truth. Keep youthful hearts in China and keep youthful hearts in India. Let's be of the same mind and create a better future hand in hand. One who wishes to be successful seeks to help others to be successful. One who wishes to be understood understands others. While China is seeking its own development, we sincerely wish India to be prosperous, thriving, and powerful. We are the driving force of Asia and global development. And now we once again are at the frontier of times. China and India work together for the benefit of each other, the Asian region, and the whole world. She <coughs> expressed that he already had deep interest in the Indian civilization since he was young. And then he very knowledgeably pointed to the great periods of Indian history, the Ganges River civilization, the Veda culture, the Gupta period, and, the many, and then had many beautiful quotes from Tagore. This is exactly the same spirit in which the Schiller Institute was created 30 years ago that if a nation wants to live in peace with other nations, we have to highlight and emphasize the high cultures of the others. Not only will this new Silk Road economically benefit the other and create a higher economic platform, a progress for all participating nations, but the new Silk Road is also a metaphor for a new cultural renaissance where each nation will emphasize and revive the best, uh, most beautiful poetry, music, and philosophy. Xi Jinping, uh, at the uh, occasion of the 2,565th birthday of Confucius, uh, <clears throat> basically said at an international seminar, if a country or a nation does not cherish its own thinking and culture, if they lose their soul, no matter which country or nation, it will not be able to stand. And that is the problem of Europe, and that is the problem of America, that we have lost our culture and we have lost our soul. And Xi Jinping said also, classics should be embedded into the student's mind and become the genes of the Chinese culture. For China, Confucius, Mencius, and the 5,000 years of its history is right now becoming very rapidly the identity of the entire nation. And the Chinese government makes a tremendous effort that everybody finds out about 5,000 years of Chinese history and uh, sheer, uh, adheres to that. In India, <coughs> a similar effort is being made to study the Vedic writings, uh, the Rig Veda, the beautiful song of creation, uh, the Santan, San, 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 Sanata Dharma, which means the, there is an eternal religion above all other religions, which is exactly the idea of Nicholas of Cusa, that there is a higher truth which unites all of mankind and a higher uh, being which is above religions. Or as Tagore said in his famous dialogue with Einstein, when our universe is in harmony with man, the eternal, we know it as truth, we feel it as beauty. Now for Russia, that means that the power of Pushkin's poetry and the prescience of Vernadsky uh, must be equally uh, made a question of uh, national identity. And if we in Europe want to survive, we better revive our great tradition of Plato, Leonardo da Vinci, Cervantes, Rabelais, Rembrandt, Nicolaus of Kuhs, Leibniz, Bach, Beethoven, and Schiller. 
and revive the noble self-conception of men these people had. We need, as Narendra Modi said, a mass movement for development, not only in India and other developing countries, but we need a mass movement for development, especially in the nations of Europe and the United States. We need a movement to join the BRICS countries for the creation of a better, more harmonious world for the development of all nations on this planet. And this mass movement for development must be inspired by a passionate love for mankind. For Russia, this new paradigm must be based on the beauty of Pushkin's poetry and, you know, Vernadsky, who, uh, as Lyndon LaRouche wrote already in his book, The Next 50 Years of the Planet Earth, must be defined uh, as the sublime notional reference for which uh, it includes the uh, serious question, uh, what is the difference between countries in a quasi-axiomatic way? How will the Noosphere uh, <coughs> basically uh, look in two generations from now? What is the best approach uh, for the fulfillment and requirements of national and personal sovereignty in the course of the next gen two generations or more, as well as the creation of an urgently needed improvement of the characteristics and quality of the Noosphere? We have to define the solution for the present problems of the world from the standpoint of the future. Where do we as mankind want to be in two generations or in 100 years from now? If we don't want to be in a dark age where only a few million people, miserable people, are cave dwelling in the wilderness, or have a mankind which is extinct because we could not get rid of the empire in time to avoid thermonuclear extinction, then we have to affirm the identity of mankind as the only known creative species in the universe so far. Let us therefore create a mass movement for the common aims of mankind, for a vision of the future, a world where we have accomplished energy and raw material security for all of humanity because we have established an industrial base on the moon for mining of helium-3 for fusion energy production and other raw materials, which will give us the condition for an isotope economy, precision medical procedure and manufacturing, space propulsion with one gravity constant acceleration, space travel to further away heavenly borders, Mars, and asteroids, and where we will be able to have the defense of the planet Earth against asteroids, meteorites, and comets. <clears throat> we will have new scientific revolutions to find out what our solar system, our galaxy, what is the universe with its billions of galaxies, what it really is. This new inclusive uh, security architecture, architecture has to proceed from that standpoint. The new Silk Road concept will not only be a connection among nations on the planet, like the ancient Silk Road, but it will be a world land bridge connecting all continents, but it will also lift mankind up to the stars together, elevate us to sink on the level of the coincidencia oppositorum, the coincidence of opposite developed by Nicolaus of Kuhs. This must become the identity of mankind in the new Silk Road, that of a creative species which will be in cohesion next, uh, in cohesion with the laws of the cosmic order. A Chinese dream since ancient times has come true. The lunar probe, named after the mythical Chinese goddess Chang'e, began its descent towards the moon on December the 14th at 9 p.m. Beijing time. About 12 minutes later, it touched down on the moon crater Sanus Iridum, or the Bay of Rainbows. <laughs> Just one day after the Chang'e 3 landed on the surface of the moon, the sixth-wheel Jutu rover was sent out to begin exploring. As it reached 9 meters north, the lunar lander and rover snapped photos of each other. 
The color images were transmitted light back to Earth via a deep space network designed by China. It was the first time images of the Chinese national flag had been taken on an extraterrestrial body. As photos from outer space were being transmitted back to the Beijing Aerospace Command and Control Center, cheers and congratulations were shared all around. The chief commander of the lunar program declared the Chang'e 3 mission a complete success. Next. <clears throat> um, so we have, it is in our hands. Do we want to have a humanity to become truly human? Um, this is a, a short uh, excerpt of the Raphael picture, uh, you know, where God is touching the hand of Adam. And that is a symbol for man becoming the divine creative species. And as a last picture, I want to show you a design of a Chinese uh, men at a recent conference uh, to show how China is reaching out to the United States. Next. <laughs> and in that spirit, <laughs> Thank you.